Hello everyone. So I'm here to talk about head and neck cancer care, improving communication, swallowing, and quality of life. So this is my disclaimer, and this is me. So I am Jessica Nebraski. I am a speech language pathologist at St. Luke's, physical therapy at St. Luke's on 8th Avenue Neuro Rehab Center. So our course objectives what we're here today to talk about. So the first is discussing TNM staging systems uh, per the American Joint Cancer Committee regarding the site and severity of cancer. We're going to talk about treatment toxicities in the early and late stages of head and neck cancer, how we use some outcome measures in this population, and talk about some treatment techniques for dysphagia um, throughout the course of patient's treatment. So I had recently attended a uh, cancer care conference through ASHA in 2019, so a lot of this information is and things I learned came from this great conference. Um, so one of, we're, first of all, the cancer incidence with this population, uh, of almost 54,000 new cases of head and neck cancer are diagnosed annually. Overall, uh, head and neck cancer has been in a decline, secondary to reduced cigarette smoking in adults. However, there has been a rise in HPV-related cancers. Um, approximately 70% of oral pharyngeal cancers are testing as HPV positive, um, according to 2017 CDC. Um, head and neck cancer is ranked sixth most common worldwide, mostly in males um, around age 60. Um, more people are surviving cancer these days, which is great with technology and um, research and all of that. However, these patients are left with the side effects of the treatment. And especially when we're talking about head and neck cancer, um, swallowing being one of the big side effects that could persist, so changes the way they eat for the rest of their life. So I want to go over some treatment terminology. Um, as a speech language pathologist that works with this population fairly frequently. Uh, I've come to do a lot of chart reviews and kind of had to learn some of the lingo that the oncologists, radiologists, ENTs are using. So this is just to familiarize yourself if you ever come across this or any SLPs out there who are new to treating this uh, diagnosis. Or So we're just going to briefly run through them. So RT is when we're talking about treatment of radiation. CRT is the combination of chemo and radiation, SRT, surgery following radiation, and then SX as surgery. So when we talk about what the plan is, there's a definitive treatment plan, which is the primary treatment. So say they just want to have surgery, and that's the only thing that they're going to do. The, the doctors and the patient decide not on any chemo radiation, so definitively surgery to treat, um, more, as opposed to a uh, concurrent treatment, which is simultaneous with other therapies, so adding the chemo and the radiation. Uh, the induction or neoadjuvant is very popular, um, something that they start with. So they're going to shrink a tumor first, and then from there decide how much radiation they might need based on the, hopefully, uh, shrinkage of that tumor. Adjuvant means that in addition to another treatment, so Say they tried that surgery definitively and it didn't cure. You know, their pet came back with, with more light up. So they're going to do what's called adjuvant therapy, which basically means we're going to give them radiation because what we tried didn't work. Um, and then the palliative is just more symptom management for um, higher stage cancers. Okay, so we're up at our first um, bullet point here, which is the TNM staging. So TNM is the stands for tumor, the nodes, and metastasis. So again, this is just familiarizing yourself with reading these chart reviews um, so you understand what we're looking at when we're talking to patients about their cancer. So the tumor stage is basically either going to be a TX, which it can't be measured, and then zero through four. T0 is there's no tumor evident versus one through four is basically the size of it. So T4 would be the largest that this tumor or stage would ever be. The N, the lymph nodes, um, so they're gonna look at how many nodes are affected, and this number spans from one to three. And then the metastasis um, 
this is really going to be either a zero or a one. So did the cancer metastasize anywhere else? Did it spread to any other parts of the body? Um, you might see in some of these um, bullets here, cancer in situ, S-I-T-U. Uh, basically, that means cells are only in the primary site, and it hasn't been felt anywhere else. So it's sort of similar to the T0. Um, the, another couple of initials you might see are the uh, lowercase c and p, which stands for clinical and pathological stages. So at the bottom there, you can see an example. So this would be something that I would read in a note, um, and now I know what all those letters and numbers mean. You know, it's a stage 3 tumor with no nodal involvement or metastasis anywhere else. Okay, so when we talk about the quality of life with these patients, we're looking at the treatment toxicities. So these are things that are going to affect them for possibly months or years to come. And this is where real, we are, as therapists, really can jump in and be a part of it. So xerostomia, dry mouth, we're going to go into this a little bit deeper um, later on, but this is a big one. Um, the term neoplastic pain is pain from the actual tumor itself, depending on where it is. Radiation fibrosis, so this is uh, the scar tissue has really uh, developed and formed after, as a result of the radiation therapy. Um, and this is someone who may benefit from, you know, some PT or lymphedema treatment if they're having a lot of fibrotic things. Uh, dyskusia is taste alterations. Again, this is something we usually see in speech if we're working with their eating. Um, things don't taste good. You know, they want to try chocolate pudding, but it tastes like metal or it tastes like cardboard. Um, and this is something that could persist for weeks and months. Um, dysphagia, so swallowing impairment, big in a speech therapy world. Odonophagia is a pain with swallowing, again, as a treatment toxicity usually associated with radiation. Trismus, so decreased mouth opening. Lymphedema, swelling resulting um, from impaired lymphatic damage uh, or drainage, I'm sorry. And this um, something post-treatment of head and neck cancer, so about 75% of them are going to be have some sort of lymphedema to that area. Another great uh, treatment protocol for, for patients to go through, hopefully see a lymphedema specialist. An autonomic dysfunction refers to having blood pressure or heart uh, rate problems as a result of their treatment. Otalgia would be ear pain, arrhythmia, being redness, edema, swelling, and mucositis, mouth ulcers, and or pain. So that's a bunch of sores in the mouth or throat as a result of their treatment. Oh, another big one before I jump in this slide, um, neck and shoulder pain are really big side effects that I have seen with my patients um, as a result of the radiation to their neck or face. So a lot of times it's a question we ask them and talk to them to make sure they're getting a referral for physical therapy if that's one of the side effects as well. Okay, so we're going to jump into these two big side effects that I often see, mucositis and xerostomia. xerostomia I'm sorry. Um, there was a 2018 study by Barnard et al. that followed 96 patients uh, three years longitudinally for their treatment toxicities. And 80% reported persistent dry mouth or xerostomia for three years. So this is a big one um, that's going to be a problem. And we just find what works for them give them strategies, give them, you know, things that hopefully will help, but unfortunately it will last probably a lot longer than would, they would want it to. So when it comes to how we can help them, so let's jump back to the mucositis first. So that's the sores and ulcers that happen in the mouth and throat as a result of their treatment, most likely radiation. So we want to talk to them about good oral hygiene. So cleaning their mouth and not just you know, in the morning and at night, like most of us do, but before or after they eat anything, um, probably maybe even making a schedule and doing it every three hours, just really keeping their mouth clean because any added bacteria or food that's left over is just going to irritate any of those open sores. So kind of walking them through an oral hygiene routine. A lot of times we ask them to bring in their toothbrush and tongue scrapers and all of that and bring them to the sink and say, show me what your oral care looks like. Cause a lot of times it's not as good as we want it to be. So that's something that you don't want to let slide 
because um, it really can make a big difference with their pain overall. Um, talking to them about oral rinses, a lot of times physicians will encourage them to do the baking soda and water, prescribing what's called magic mouthwash. Um, but it is, you know, just something to be familiar with if your patient says, I'm on magic mouthwash. What that is, is a lidocaine, Benadryl, and Maalox mix. Essentially, it's something you swoosh around, it kind of numbs your mouth for five minutes, ten minutes, not a huge deal, but they like to use it before eating or before brushing their teeth if the pain is really bad. Um, and then nutrition. So if we're talking about open sores that are in the mouth or the throat, they need to heal. And if they're not getting the nutrition that they need or they're malnourished, it's going to take a lot longer for things to heal. So we have to encourage that they're eating or getting whatever the nutrition, you know, that they they can as you know, and following with dietitian as well. Okay, and then some uh, dry mouth tips that I've kind of come across along the way. So biotin is a very common over-the-counter mouthwash spray. They have a bunch of products uh, that I've seen patients use to help moisten the mouth, give that um, feeling like they have the saliva they need. Other companies are out there, Oasis, MedActive, and Mouth Coat. Um, chewing gum, I have encourage patients if they're not dealing with a lot of pain, um, just to kind of keep their salivar salivatory glands like awake and you got something in your mouth. Um, just kind of like if you start thinking about a sour lemon, how your mouth fills up with saliva, you know, just chewing and thinking of uh, moving your mouth can get some juices flowing. Um, drinking lots of water. That's honestly probably what the most research shows. Unfortunately, there's not a magic pill, a magic spray. The more water you take, in um, and always have water with you. It's really going to be the most relief. Um, it could take three months or more to normalize, so three months would be great, um, but honestly it's probably going to be closer to a year. This study said three years, so again three years to normalize, not necessarily get better. Hopefully things get, continue to get better, but it's a, it's a long process. Um, and then Xylomelts was something a patient of mine recently discovered on Amazon and read a bunch of reviews and purchased it and tried it. Essentially what it was, it looked like a Tic Tac and he put it on the inside of his cheek um, in between his teeth and he would put them in at night because he would wake up a lot with a really dry mouth and it would slowly dissolve and kind of keep his mouth moist. Again, it's kind of a band-aid, um, but he did find that it offered him a little bit of relief. So. Just another, another tool in our toolbox. Okay, so trismus. So this is another one that I talk a lot about with my patients. This is something we should screen for as speech therapists on evaluation. Um, we want to see how wide they can open their mouth. So we can screen for it even if they haven't had their treatment yet, just to kind of get a baseline. So we know what's normal for them. Um, normal opening could be four centimeters, but who knows? Everybody's different. But if we're noticing that things change as their treatment goes on, do we need to intervene? So there's a couple pictures on this slide. The first one is called a dynasplint uh, with that lady on there. Um, and the second picture on the bottom is a therabyte. So they're basically just devices to help a jaw opening. Um, depending, from my experience, the Therabyte wasn't covered by insurance and it's a bit over 400 bucks. Um, Dynasplint, I don't have any personal experience with, but um, it is something that's out there. Um, I, I read a study in 2017 that talked about uh, acupuncture to try and treat this kind of trismus, like ear acupuncture, um, thinking, you know, why not? Unfortunately, that it didn't have any significant effects on their pain or opening. Um, but it was a thought. They're uh, listed here, talks about soft tissue mobilization. So recently a few of us uh, SLPs in the network got trained in MFR. So I have been using this technique with patients um, for this manual treatment on them if they are suffering from trismus to help with uh, jaw opening and getting them set up with some sort of jaw home exercise program. Um, there are other things like nerve stabilizing agents and Botox out there. Um, but again, think about when you can eat, your swallowing's great, but you can't bite into a big juicy hamburger and that's all you want. So um, just kind of something to, to think about and make sure we screen for. 
Um, so as far as speech therapy and uh, how we're managing these patients, I know I'm talking a lot about swallowing, but you know we're looking at their communication as well. If they had a you know, glossectomy and you know partial glossectomy and had half their tongue out, are we looking at their their communication as well and their ability to speak? So we're going to talk to the patients about what what's meaningful to them. What do they want to work on? Um, if they are post surgery, you know, knowing what the protocol is, you know, we don't want to do any tongue exercises if it's still healing, things like that. So being uh, familiar with the case and physician's orders is important. Um, with that being said, there is a tumor board meeting every three weeks on a Wednesday morning um, that I personally attend as sort of the physical therapy speech therapist, um, you know, leader who kind of goes and meets with the team, ENTs and oncology and all of that, and goes through the list of all active patients. So if you have any patients that have a head and neck diagnosis are being seen by St. Luke's, most likely they are going to come up in this meeting. So a lot of times when I get the meeting patient list, I will forward it out to you guys in the network. If you're not getting this, please contact me. I'd be happy to send it to you. But, you know, we want to make sure we're, you know, stepping up at asking these doctors about questions we might have or vice versa, you know, the doctors will want to know, you know, so-and-so is off, you know, eating solids now and they'll be happy to hear that. So we like to, you know, keep the lines of communication open with them and just keep letting them know that we're here, poking them, making sure you're referring to us because, I, you know, these patients need us to be their advocates. The doctors are advocating to help get their cancer cured and that is number one, right? But what are they going to be left with? And eating and talking is such a big part of their quality of life. And that is where we step in and we need to advocate for them. So our big role is education, you know, and educating the physicians, educating patients that this is what we're here to do, especially as a speech language pathologist, they might not even know that this is what we do, you know my speech is fine, why am I seeing you kind of thing. So make sure you're advocating for who you are and what you do um, to help with those, those referrals. So I'm going to introduce uh, a case and just kind of paint the picture. We're going to talk about a lot of treatment and uh, evaluation things, and then I'm going to wrap it up at the end of how this guy did. Um, but just to introduce you to him, um, we're going to call him John. Um, so John is... Uh, I'm protecting his identity by just calling him John. That's not his name, but we're going to call him John. He is a 39-year-old male who noticed a bump on his tongue in December of 2018. Uh, eventually went and got it biopsied in March of the following year and was diagnosed with stage 3 um, squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue. Um, so he started with chemotherapy. So they wanted to do the uh, neoadjuvant trial of just the chemo to shrink the tumor and then do the adjuvant radiation. So he had the chemo, had his surgery, right neck dissection, and then started chemo radiation. Or I'm sorry, started radiation. So you can kind of see the timeline there. His speech therapy initial evaluation was in August of 2019. So his picture didn't really, we didn't really get into his picture until the radiation was starting, which is fine. We're trying to educate doctors to get us in a little bit sooner, but as you'll see, he ended up being on our caseload for seven months po after we initially saw him because it's a lot we were working on, but um, it, we were glad to at least get him in before the, the radiation hit him hard. And when we saw, you know, 39, that's pretty young. So when we did see him, we asked him what his goal was, and he was just really excited to get things started. He was happy that we were, you know, we had a plan in place to keep his swallowing and his talking as, as good as possible throughout his treatment. Um, and he was really motivated to to keep his weight up and, and do his exercises. So, um, so yeah, so keep John in the back of your heads, um, and we're going to wrap up with how he did at the end here. So, Let's jump into outcome measures. So this was another objective we're going to talk about. Um, listed here are six ones that I yeah, use, I've heard about, um, have good research behind them. There's 
three that are clinician reported, three that are patient reported. I definitely like to do at least one of each. Um, in the case of John, I did the FOIS and the E10 were the objective measures I used throughout his treatment. Um, but we're going to walk through all of them. So starting with the performance status scale, this is a clinician uh, reported outcome. So this is something where it's not something you you give them, right? So you're rating it based on how they're answering you. So it's, it's a semi-structured interview, um, and there's three different items. So if you look at the normalcy of a diet, it's, it uh, goes up in ratings of 10. So you might want to talk to them about what they're eating, which is something we always do. You know, are you able to eat applesauce and pudding? Great, that's a puree, so that's 30. So let's bump up to a soft, non-chewable. You know, how about you know, more of a, um, I'm sorry, granola, not granola, um, like a jello-y kind of texture where it just kind of melts in your mouth. Okay, how about maybe a cooked vegetable, like a carrot or a banana, something more soft and chewy, and kind of work your way up the scale. And basically when they say, oh, that's where my cutoff is, or I avoid that, then that's where you you stop asking and you know they're at a level of a 50 or 60 whatever based on that scale and this and the same goes for the the speaking and eating in public so it's not an average it's just sort of based on that that scale there's no in between sort of thing um the FOIS so like I said with John this is what I used um and I'm going off of, again, just my interview. I'm not telling him what number he is. This is just in my note. Um, so numbers one through three would be if he was on a feeding tube, um, and four through seven is no feeding tube, you know, PO, obviously. So at initial evaluation, I believe he was a six. Um, because he had had a partial glossectomy, he was, you know, making sure he was eating softer foods. So uh, that's a great way to track their progress, you know, both ways. Um, the Eat 10, like I said, was the other one I used with him, and this is a questionnaire. So it's 10 questions on a scale of 0 to 4, 0 being no problem, 4 being a severe problem. How would you answer the following questions? Um, so swallowing liquids takes extra effort. Swallowing solids takes extra effort. So uh, the highest score you can get is a 40. I usually actually like to do this um, not just at eval, re-eval, discharge, you know, maybe because things are changing so rapidly, especially through their treatment, a weekly basis would be fine. You know, things, it's just a great objective measure to have and a score. Um, since we don't do anything like a photo or anything, this is a, this is a great score to, to show their progress. Um, the MD Anderson inventory. So this is a 20 item patient reported outcome. This is very similar to the VHI. If anyone is familiar with VHI, this is just a dysphagia VHI, essentially. So they're answering questions in their opinion, be strongly agree or disagree. Um, it's a pretty validated, reliable uh, questionnaire. I'm not currently using it. I, I could. Um, I should. <laughs> I just um, I'm in my Eat 10 FOIS mood right now, but this is a great one to have in your toolbox. Um, so the next one is the digest. So this is something that you would use if you're doing MBSs, uh, modified barium swallows, or swallow studies. So this I don't give because I'm an outpatient, so I don't um, give this outcome. But this could be a great tool for inpatient SLPs to use, um, especially since we're trying to involve them in our treatment protocol of these patients, where we want them to get a swallow study. Uh, as soon as they get their diagnosis. So we kind of have a baseline of their swallowing and something to compare it to as treatment goes along. Um, so if any of you inpatient SLPs out there are listening, look into the digest. It was one that came up with the research and the ASHA care conference I did. Um, so as a, just a thought, contact me if you want to know more. Um, and then the VHI I mentioned before, which was like, um, the MD Anderson one. This is not a swallowing questionnaire. This is a voice handicap index. So even 
Uh, like I said, a lot of these patients might be having a dysarthria speech issue as well as voice changes. So VHI, um, we should be giving to all voice patients um, regardless, but definitely a good outcome measure for if we're treating the slurred speech or voice changes after head and neck treatment. Okay, so now that we have our outcome measures and we're looking at treatment planning, um, what, what are we going to do? So on here I talk about pretreatment counseling. So in this aspect I'm talking about pretreatment of their cancer treatment. So I ask them, like, what do they know? What do they think is going to happen? What, what do they expect out of, say, chemo radiation? What are their goals? And what do you, what did, what do you want out of this from speech therapy? This is what I do. Um, I kind of want to see how realistic that they are and what they've been told from a physician. I'm not here to, you know, burst their bubble, but I am here to educate. And again, like I said previously, these doctors are trying to cure their cancer and that is their main, I, you know, goal of their treatment. And they talk about that. So there may not be a ton of discussion about swallowing in their question or in their, um, appointments with the patient and if the patient isn't asking these questions how are they going to know so when we educate on this evaluation if my patient's coming to see me before they start treatment it's m my responsibility to tell them what may or may not happen and prepare you know hope for the best prepare for the worst a little bit but be as realistic as i can with them and then kind of justifying why i'm in the picture you know, this is my, this is what's going to happen. And this is what you can do to make it as best as possible. You know, you're going to have a better outcome after this is done if you follow my plan. So just, you know, you know, you might have to be a little rough about it saying you may not be able to eat and you may, things are going to hurt and you, but we're going to work through it and get you, you know, get the radiation done, go through it and, you know, get you as best as we can. So when we're looking at the patient themselves, some factors we want to consider, obviously, um, the patient's age is a factor. Um, like I said with my my patient, John, he's 39. So that kind of was a big light bulb for me where I was like, yes, he's going to be great because he's young and, you know, he doesn't have a lot of, you know, muscle loss, you know, kind of issue, the sarcopenia and frailty. Um he doesn't probably have a lot of comorbidities along with it, you know, blood pressure, all of that. So, you know, we want to take that into consideration. Uh, as well as support and motivation. This is a big one, especially the motivation. So head and neck cancer can be, can bring out the rough and tough kind of patient, um, especially, you know, if it's related to the smoking and drinking, drug use, any of that. So we have to understand that and again you get support from their family spouse whomever that you know if they want to live the best life that they can you know try and get them to to buy into our you know program and and really do the best that we can but you know we're also looking at possible low ses where they can't get here and they or they take the bus and things like that so just something to be aware of um and sensitive to um, so we're, we're looking obviously at tumor site and size, you know, being familiar with that staging I discussed earlier, um, radiation. So we don't need to know, or I mean, we don't, it doesn't matter what the, you know, the radiation plan as far as where they're going, you know, what kind of radiation or anything. I like to know how many sessions they're getting, like, or how far into the treatment they are just to you know, encourage them like, okay, you're halfway through, you got this, you know, and just be on their team as, and, you know, be familiar with what their treatment plan is and, and the technique used and where they're radiating all of that. Um, Cause we're going to be looking at their radiation associated dysphagia. Um, obviously a lot of damage to the muscles here. So that's where we step in. Um, and then the surgery, of course, being familiar with where their surgery was you know like i said before that partial glossectomy you know did they just cut the tumor out did they use a skin flap you know off their wrist or thigh you know what just being familiar with all 
their history and how that's going to affect, you know, your speech and swallowing treatment. If they have half their tongue out, obviously they can't do certain things. Okay. So more about swallow treatment. Um, so I sort of talked about it before, but I'm going to keep pushing for it. So a lot of research um, is really recommending the treatment, specifically dysphagia treatment, before, during, and after radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, all of that. Um, there was a 2018 meta-analysis that showed that patients with head and neck cancer undergoing chemo and radiation who completed weekly swallowing intervention showed improvements in swallow function at the three to six month mark. So it wasn't immediate, but it was improvement and it just it took a little bit, but it, it was there. And that's just, like I said, this is a long process. You know, my guy, John was with me. I mean, his process started before he even met me, but it was seven months of keeping him in treatment to, to finally feel like, okay, you got this, he's eating. Um, so we want to push the, you know, the phrase use it or lose it kind of thing. We need to get you to keep eating this. The fact that you're going through this treatment doesn't mean you can slack off and not, not work those muscles. So we want to initiate feeding uh, as much as possible. I think, I don't know if it was a study or if it was during one of my uh, the conference lectures that I was listening to, but someone had talked about, does, do feeding tubes cause dysphagia? I thought that was really interesting because, you know, obviously they don't, you know, it's a feeding tube. It's supposed to help you eat, but it was more like the psychological aspect of it. Like, you know, it's going to be really hard to eat that. I think I'm just going to use my feeding tube, not worry about it. And then they get in this pattern of not rely, not eating PO, even though they can, it's just, it takes a lot more work, doesn't taste great, all of those things. Hmm. And they just, you know, disuse atrophy kind of thing. So uh, different physicians have different stances on feeding tubes. And, you know, I don't, I'm not here to get into a feeding tube debate, but um, definitely something to think about, you know, and a lot of our patients do get feeding tubes. John got a feeding tube and it's okay, but we ate as much PO as we could on top of having a feeding tube. It doesn't mean that, okay, that's all, that's how you're going to eat now. It's just that nutrition is such a key to healing that if that's what it's going to take, that's fine. But um, PO is the way to go. That was really lame. <laughs> okay. So, Dysphagia management. Okay. Swallowing after surgery is a learned behavior. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're teaching them how to do something that was so automatic and now they're thinking about it so much. It hurts. Um, things don't go, feel like they're going down the right way. We need to dive into why, um, we can talk about saliva management. Um, obviously swallow studies to help rule out any problems to be able to reintroduce PO, um, increasing volumes of PO as we go. So that's more, you know, as a workout, you know, rather than taking the small little bites, let's, let's make them bigger bites and really make you work a little bit harder to push it down. And then obviously complexity of it, increasing the diet levels. Again, our goal is to keep them eating throughout the radiation. And if they can't eat or if they're just having a hard time with it or they can't because they're a high aspiration risk let's do some swallowing exercises you're just swallowing your spit you're doing that all day long anyways let's turn it into um, an exercise um, to maximize the use of swallow muscles during radiotherapy is minimizing pharyngeal disuse so swallow 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 <laughs> it's the goal okay so swallow therapy so what are we doing um so I'm not going to dive into all these exercises because you SLPs out there know what these are. Um, but what listed here, the Mendelssohn's, super superglottics, effortfuls, masakos, all those fun ways to tell people how to swallow, sticking their tongue out, you know, standing on their head, all that crazy stuff they look at us when we tell them to do. But, you know, we have to get creative. Um, so there are tools out there. Um, so I, I listed the EMST which is something I recently had started with my patients uh, with head and neck cancer. So it's an expiratory muscle strength 
training device. So it essentially looks like an inhaler. And they blow into it, um, or yeah, blow into it, and it's working on building muscles for the cough. So it's not specifically for head and neck cancer patients. It's like for singers and swimmers and Parkinson's is a big one actually. But when it comes to chronic aspirators, which could be our patients with radiation induced dysphagia, this is some, a tool and a device that they can train on at home to help the muscles of the cough to prevent um, aspiration pneumonia. You know, if they're feeling something coming, going down the wrong way, they have that strong cough. And while they're, you know, blowing into it, it is, you know, you are getting high laryngeal elevation, things like that. Um, so that's a device. It's about 50 bucks, um, maybe 55, but it's out of pocket that my patients are buying them and then bringing them into the clinic. I run them through a home exercise program, have a little checklist that they're doing it, you know, five times a day, whatever it is. Um, but it's something besides thinking about your soul, you know, so having something in your hand is always a great tool, you know, motivator for them, reminder what to do. Um, you know, I listed lingual extra, lingual strengthening too, you know, if we're trying to work on moving their tongue around, you know, the tongue depressor, have that as a reminder in their bathroom or next to their couch. Okay. I got to do my tongue exercises. Um, so though, those are more of those indirect things. Um, I have the, McNeil Dysphagia Therapy Program listed on here, um, and this is a systematic exercise-based approach to dysphagia therapy in adults. Um, it's an individualized therapy, so this was a program they talked a lot about in my conference, and essentially it's using food as the weight. You know, so if a patient, say, is on regular liquids, maybe have them take some honey thick liquid swallows, hard swallows with a honey thick liquid because it's a heavier bolus, you know, than just doing effortful swallows with just their spit or saliva. So things like that. So kind of, or, you know, every time you take a bite of your dinner tonight, you know, think about an effortful swallow or choose a meal and make it something hard. And yeah, it might feel like it gets stuck and you're going to have to work really hard, but that's your therapy. So um, that was, uh, you know, a, a really great program that I, I think can be uh, systematic and, again, exercise-based uh, to talk our patients through. Um, oral care, we talked about this a little bit earlier about making sure they're cleaning their mouth out to prevent, you know, any pain or aspiration risk, um, and then managing their symptoms throughout their therapy. So always making, you know, kind of going over some of those toxicities we might see. Um, so just a couple things from studies that I, I read. Um, this is a 2012 Langmore study that talked about um, how NPO, being NPO for as little as two weeks can cause uh, long-term effects of getting back to 100% PO. So it kind of talks a little bit about that feeding tube dysphagia question, you know, um, even if they can't eat fully by mouth, making sure we're encouraging as much as we can to keep those muscles active because even two weeks on a break can be detrimental to their long-term outcomes. So finding what's the safest for them, obviously, to eat, but encouraging every day to be using those muscles and, and eating and swallowing as much as they can. Um, then there was what's called the use it or, uh, use it or lose it study, which I kind of talked about before. Um, and this was uh, 2013 Hutchinson. And this was basically, if I'm still eating, what's the benefit in exercising? You know, if, if, if I'm eating okay, well, why, why are you making me exercise? Um, and this is a huge question and a huge debate that will happen when I get these patients in after diagnosis and they haven't started their treatment because they're not having those problems yet. So this is when I really justify the prophylactic swallowing exercises are shown to help long-term outcomes. So another reason, obviously if they're going to be going through treatment, which most likely is radiation five times a week, it might be hard to get them in the clinic. So if we can get them to meet us, 
get in our office, teach them all the exercises they need to know before they go into the, the world of cancer treatment, at least we can check in on them and we kind of built that foundation um, to be able to get them to do these exercises as soon as possible. Um, so this was a study over 90% of patients who returned back to their regular diet two years post by doing these prophylactic swallowing exercises and swallow stuff all through, so with shorter feeding tube dependence. So the research is there. It's just getting the patients motivated to do it and, you know, showing them what they need to swallow and, and work on that it will improve their quality of life. So the proactive swallowing therapy, we're going to talk to them about, obviously, those exercises. Three sets of 10 is great, um, easy to remember. Eating all through radiation, I went through um, kind of as much as they can. Putting them on a mealtime routine, you know, managing their pain. If it's painful to eat, you know, maybe talking to them about doing smaller meals, you know, if they get fatigued or it hurts, starts to hurt after 10, 15 minutes, you know, let's try smaller meals throughout the day so you don't get to that point where it's just so painful. Um, then post-radiation maintenance education. Okay, so my patients, or our patients who have radiation, they get a set amount of radiation sessions. You're going to have 35 sessions of radiation, and that's your treatment. So when they make it to 35, you know, they have a number, right? So they know they have to make it to 35 sessions and they're done radiation. And a lot of patients actually get through it pretty okay. Probably halfway to the end is when things start to get bad. But they make it to their last session and it's awesome. They're done, right? Then kind of stuff goes off the rail and that's what not a lot of patients expect because the effects start to almost get worse after the radiation is over. And then they're left with these side effects that they don't have an end date for. So I get a lot of patients who are just honestly depressed or really um, discouraged because they they made it. They're like, yes, I made it through my radiation, but well, you know they're just feeling really terrible. So you know we want to help them maintain as much as they can throughout their treatment, stay, you know, be on their side, tell them, you know, we've got to get over these barriers, you know, if, if pain is your issue, let's talk about how we can manage the pain, and then, okay, the pain goes away, now your mouth is so dry, how are we going to deal with that, um, all of these things, so we got to just stay with them um, until the dust settles, and hopefully they're back to the highest level of diet that they can. Um, so, this tip for eating that's mentioned on this slide comes from the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, it kind of talks a little bit about that McNeil uh, dysphagia therapy where you kind of eat as exercise. So they said you may feel solid food stick normally in your throat while you eat, although you may want to grab for a drink to wash the food down. Uh, try a hard, fast swallow instead to help clear the food, and you may need to repeat this several times. This is a good exercise for your throat when you when you swallow thick, heavy foods. So it kind of goes against what we want to tell them to do, where you know, take a sip of water to get that down. It could be dangerous, um, but this is how they're using this functional meal time as an exercise. Push, push, push. Um, so obviously, we're giving them, you know, education on aspiration precautions and, you know, making sure they're supervised and things like that. But um, that could be a way to integrate it and maximize it into their day, their day. Okay, and then this, this slide came from a study um, in 2018 uh, with Hutchinson again, who, that it was that EMST, so that little device I was telling you about where they measured maximum expiratory pressure um, with 64 radiation associated aspirators. Um, so basically, like I said, when they're blowing into it, we're looking at hyaluronal lift, um, we're pumping the veal pharynx, um, working on expiratory force. So it showed that 57% showed improvements, um, which I think is pretty great uh, for just a little device that you just have to blow into. Um, doesn't involve eating or anything like that, but just I think uh, 
it's worth a shot. I have one in my office I like to show people. Um, if this is something you're thinking of getting, I would recommend doing that. Um, like ordering it through, you know, a PO order um, or asking your whoever does the orders in your office to, to pick one up or, um, just so it makes more sense to them. Show them, show them how you do it. Obviously, don't let them use it. You know, it's your own mouthpiece, but explain to them how it works and then walking them through the program. Um, you know, there's there was a lot of, enough research behind it that it made me comfortable, you know, telling them that I think it's worth, you know, if they're one of those patients who's like motivated, like John, who was just like, I want to do everything I can to get the best outcome. You know, he's the one I recommended it to. You know, if I have a hard time getting a patient in my office, you know, I might not say it because I might just sit on their kitchen table, but um, definitely a good tool for those who are super motivated. Um, okay, so lastly, we're going to wrap up with, with John here. So I'm going to kind of tell you how he did. So just as a refresher, he was 39. Um, he had a history of smoking for about 15 years, a little bit of drinking, nothing excessive. Um, he worked at a chemical plant with an engineering degree. He was married, um, a cat, really nice guy. Um, so his evaluation with me, or I'm sorry, his evaluation wasn't with me. I was not here, but uh, Erica, I believe, did his evaluation on August 29th. And his FOIS score was a 6. So you can get a 7. So remember, he had that tongue surgery. Um, then his EAT 10 was a 4 out of 40. So you want that score to be low. So he was a 4. We sent him for a swallow study a week later to get an idea of where he was as baseline as we could. Um, but he you know, was status post right glossectomy. So he did have mild to, model, mild to moderate oral dysphagia with mild pharyngeal dysphagia um, with some inability to form a bolus, um, some penetration with liquids. Um, he came back a week after his swallow study. He was about 15 sessions into his 20 radiation sessions and he was starting to have some mild to moderate oral pain um, and soreness. Um, he started complaining of some shoulder and neck pain, um, talked about PT, told him to get a referral. Um, we assessed his understanding of exercises using our Vital Stim Plus with biofeedback. So this is an SEMG device we have where we can hook up a lot of Vital Stim electrodes, have them do Mendelssohn's effort pulls, and they have that biofeedback screen to know if they're doing it or not. So it's a great way to make sure your patients know what they're doing. Um, reviewed the recommendations the Swallow study had given him, you know, with prep set, things like that. About a month later, so it was about October by now, still having some pain in the oral cavity that went down to his throat. At that point, he was only drinking two insures a day, and that's literally it. He was in so much pain. Had lost 43 pounds. Was doing everything that we had told him to do. He was a perfect patient, but his pain was so bad he could only tolerate two insures. At that point, we said, all right, you need to get a feeding tube. It's just, it needs to happen. It hopefully won't be forever or very long, but you need to heal. And he was starting to, you know, decondition. So we had a feeding tube placed about a week after we saw him. Um, and then we went for another swallow study in November, three months after his initial one, to see how things were going. Um, his pain had started to decrease a little, so we wanted to see how much PO we could do. So we started him back on purees, bananas, wet pasta, things like that, um, and he was doing okay. He His FOIS went to a 2 because uh, he was using the tube with inconsistent oral intake, um, and his EAT10 went to a 29, so up from that 4, um, with mostly just eating puree and water. Um, that was like November. So a month later, December, FOIS went to three, eat 10 went down to 18. He was starting to do more PO. He was drinking these bone broths that gave him a ton of nutrients. Um, February, so a couple months, about six weeks later, FOIS went up to a three. So he was taking more consistently by mouth, but still supplementing with the tube feed. And the eat went down to a two. 
So his eat went, eat 10 went from four the first time we saw him down to a two. Things were so much better. We were pushing, pushing as much PO as we could. Um, with feeding tubes, you have to eat for two weeks without using your feeding tube, just flushing it without losing weight to be able to get it pulled. So that was our goal. He had it pulled on February 27th. Um, we had started changing our treatment plan of care a little bit after his eating was so well, went so well. We switched to MFR, <clears throat> treating his neck, jaw, and tongue. Um, and he was discharged on March 10th. Uh, so again, from start to finish, about seven months, total of 37 speech treatment visits. We did everything from oral motor exercises, EMST, vital stim, vital stim plus with biofeedback, dysarthria management, and MFR. So kind of the whole slew of everything. But he is doing awesome. Back at work, eating by mouth, no more feeding tube. You know, you can understand everything he says, have his tongue cut out. He was great. The ideal patient. And again, they're not all like that, but it's always good to talk about the good ones and, you know, how show what, you know, all the tools we can use to really change one person's life is, is amazing. So um, I'm, I put this slide on here um, to sort of highlight our physical therapy at St. Luke's sites that offer speech therapy, for those of you who don't know. Um, we do have, uh, most of them have their, their vital stem with the biofeedback. Um, and as I said, a lot of us are trained in MFR for voice and swallowing disorders. And again, if you have questions, I'm sorry this isn't live, but my name is on the first slide, so find me in the system, email me. I am happy to answer anyone's questions. Um, so thank you for listening. I put a slide of my babies on there because everyone always thinks they're cute, so welcome. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for listening and take care.